there will come a day, Gert, not very far in the future, where not everybody in the talk group will be human. Good morning, it's um, seven o'clock in the morning of the, uh, the 5th of March. I'm flying to Florida, I'm flying to the United States. Uh, it's not a really early flight, um, but it's still early enough. And the good thing about Orlando is, is that the weather is gonna be perfect. It's just around 20 degrees Celsius. And put that together, so that's a very great compliment, we think, to our command center solution. Orlando, almost there. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of TUI, welcome on board. So, arrived in the USA, the plan is to go to the budget rental car, which is just over there, grab my car, one half hour drive to the hotel, get my stuff, enjoy a little bit of sunshine, do a little bit of work. Right, totally advanced. Okay, super. Thank you so much. Okay, bye bye. So basically, it took a while to get the car because it wasn't ready when I arrived here. But they said about 30 minutes, it became about one hour. Just perfect. been threading together are a lot of acquisitions to build out the software side. Just a quick stop, uh, I don't want to spend all my data, I'm not at this store, they carry those SIM cards uh, for data only, so I need to go to Walmart. But this is the deal, I got myself a Garmin uh, for 60 bucks, so that's about 50 euros, so that's a good deal actually, I could have ended up in paying every single day a lot of money for my for my data usage on my card spending a lot of money on hiring a gps from budget rental car no i just bought a garment is the inner working with the land mobile radio systems that are there that drive took much much longer than I expected. Yeah, so for a geek like, like me, the world just gets better and better every year. I'm looking forward to see all the friends at IWC tomorrow and day after tomorrow, actually the whole week. Unfortunately, there is no water coming out of the uh, shower. <laughs> Seriously, I don't know how that works. Let's call the reception. Messages, wake up, reservations, check out, gallery host. The ironic paradox is the more you need the technology to help you, the less ability you have to command it to help you. Is that reception? Let's check gallery host. Hi, is this reception? Oh, all right. Okay, good morning, Denise. Um, um, I, I've the last half an hour I've tried to figure out how my shower works. Can you tell me how how I get water out of the uh, shower head? But the shower is not not working. It seems like, but my, maybe I'm doing something wrong here. Yes. Okay, well, I, 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 yeah, that makes sense. A little nub on, on, on the handle, right? Yeah. Yeah, please hold on, okay? Hold on, okay. For the next few days, I'm fine. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. Let's go 
for tomorrow all the solutions. Rosenshingle Creek Hotel, 3.4 miles. That is about five minutes drive, I would say. Yeah, about five minutes drive. Please drive to highlighted route. As we bring all of this technology and all the capabilities, with that comes the responsibility to make it usable in the moment. Paul Steinberg is probably not the right person to ask about financials of Motorola Solutions. He probably has a good idea about why the stock price was so very successful. But I would like to understand what else is there on his wish list. It has been one year ago that I have talked with him during IWC at the booth of Motorola Solutions. And um, I'm looking forward to that. It's good to be here at Motorola Solutions in this hotel, the Rosen Shingle Creek Hotel. That's right. That's where we are today, interviewing Paul Steinberg, CTO of Motorola Solutions. First things first, we spoke about uh, acquiring a lot of companies for Motorola Solutions, specifically on the software part. Right. Avilion is one of those companies. Is there more on your wish list? Yeah, we've actually acquired several companies. Avigilon, just the most recent one we've announced, that's about a billion dollar US acquisition that hasn't closed yet, but we hope to close it soon. Um, what we've really been threading together are a lot of acquisitions to build out the software side, primarily around the command center and the workflows. So, complementing the radio and the communication networks with the actual applications and services that actually drive those with intelligence and workflow outcomes. Uh, Vigilon, as an example, what they do is they bring video surveillance, a, a turnkey solution, you know, platform soup to nuts, if you will, of uh, intelligent cameras with analytics at the edge, uh, video storage and network, network capacity, and then of course the operationalization center behind it. So, and they bring a solution that is, you know, best in breed video analytics to detect things like faces and motion and geofencing or visual fencing, things like that. So Motorola Solutions will become a software company then or not? Certainly that's a big push of ours. And I think that, you know, in large part that has played a role in, um, you know, the success we've had over the last, uh, last couple of years. Uh, one thing that's happened is our organic business has grown. Uh, grown for the first time in quite a while. So the, the core business that is Motorola has grown. Um, our services business has grown and we've shifted more and more of our, our, uh, our revenue towards services and recurring, recurring no revenue. And then finally, a lot of the acquisitions that we spoke of um, have been really around building out the software platform. Uh, we've hired a lot of talent uh, from, from industry to actually supplant that, and we've created an entire division that's really around what we call our software enterprise, which is really around the software platforms that we're talking about here. Mobile applications, the command center, um, even you know broadband push to talk all kind of into one organization. The influx of bright young minds means that uh, our world is changing, and we see that through application challenges, for example. Sure. Hackathons, that's what you did in New Zealand in Australia? It was in Australia, yeah. We're doing increasingly more of those. Yeah, so that, with that, that also means that you get a lot of younger generation people into the company, is it? That's right. You reach to the community at large. I mean, you get university involved, you get, you get anybody that wants to contribute, so you get students involved oftentimes in the hackathons, plus you get the local industry. So you get a really good mix of people that you bring together, and you get you know, this diversity of thought and ideas that, that build, around, build solutions around our core technologies for the better of our customers. My organization, uh, the Chief Technology Office, within the last uh, two years, we've 40% uh, of the people on my team are actually new, and it's comparable in the rest of the company. There's a significant, you know, 40 to 50% of the company itself has changed over the last several years as well. Firstnet announcement was last year when I spoke to you. That's right. What happened in one year's time on Firstnet for Motorola Solutions? Yeah, I think a lot of things have occurred. So we're working closely with AT&T, who was awarded the, the prime, you know, the prime on the Firstnet contract to actually host the broadband network. Uh, so we'll power a lot of that with the public safety specifics. Obviously, what we bring is the inner working with the land mobile radio systems that are there, uh, broadband push to talk, and a lot of the applications and services that we spoke of earlier, we hope to position in there as well. So what has happened since we talked last year around FirstNet in general is um, they've they've uh, followed the, the statutory guidelines and they've rolled out their solutions and all of the states and territories have opted into their solution. Uh, so that means that you know everybody has decided not to build a rail and radio access network that they'll work with FirstNet or some carrier uh, to actually provide the broadband services for public safety going forward. The way we see that, Gert, and it's becoming increasingly visible to us now, is um, FirstNet and the land mobile radio networks, and I was actually um, uh, spoke on a panel yesterday that was really about this topic, they're increasingly becoming very, very complementary. 
there was talk about one disrupting the other. In actuality, what we see is, FirstNet is about data. It's about bringing all things data, which can be telemetry and mobile workflows and uh, digital notebooks, but also video. Um, Land Mobile Radio is the gold standard for voice, so making them work together, and the good thing about FirstNet is you can use that network as a backup for push to talk, or you can use that to extend the voice network to other, um, uh, other users as well. What else is happening? Yeah, there so, must be something else, right? Yeah, so for a geek mind like me, the world just gets better and better every year, it seems like, Kurt. So uh, a lot of the area I mentioned earlier that we've changed a lot of the, a lot of my team. So since we talked last year, I opened an AI center of excellence in Tel Aviv, uh, specifically around capturing AI for mission business critical types of applications. Uh, and so we are doing a lot of work in analytics, artificial intelligence, and machine learning for watching and understanding video, um, providing cognition behind some of the, the workflows and thought processes. We've added natural language processing, so people, you know, their most natural form of communication, that eyes up, hands free way of interacting with, with their workflow, with their work environment, um, we've actually added natural language processing. So think of it loosely like Siri for public safety or commercial users, but it's a very purpose-built interaction. It's a, it's a bot framework, I like to call it a voice API, mm -hmm. where people can construct their workflows, their dialogues in a contextual way. So, for example, um, if you think about the, the usual com commercial products today, they're kind of a one and done. You ask a question, you get an answer, and then there, there's no more context from that the next question on. What we've designed is uh, essentially the bot that understands context. It might know something like, uh, I might say, how many crimes were committed here last year? Mm -hmm. It would know where here is, and mm -hmm. the context is that. Or I might say something like, could you uh, run a license plate, Alpha Bravo Charlie 123, or a number tag? So it understands NATO codes, Alpha Bravo Charlie, gives back the result, and I might say, any wants or warrants that are active. Well, that was in the context of the previous question. So I didn't have to repeat Alpha Bravo Charlie 123 and all of that. I'm just having a conversation with it, using it to fill out forms and to populate forms, you know, so, or to have forms read back to me, transcribing the text. So increasingly powering all of this and putting that into the talk group. There will come a day, Gert, not very far in the future, where not everybody in the talk group will be human. There will be somebody sitting in there in technology that will be listening, understanding, and cognitively making some decisions to help. I might say something like, I need help, please send somebody. So I don't know where somebody near me is at that can actually help me, but somebody does. And the technology can make the decision, let me send Gert, say in this example, um, and let me tell Gert where Paul is at and let me tell Paul Gert will be there in three minutes. Mind-blowing, is it? It is, but if you think about that, the ironic paradox is the more you need the technology to help you, the less ability you have to command it to help you. So it has to react and respond in the right way. And so that's why we're trying to drive the complexity down by having the technology behave in a contextual and meaningful way. Okay.